Maria James was murdered in 1980, in what remains an unsolved case. Maria's body was found at her home in mid-1980, at the back of her second-hand bookshop. Melbourne's single mother of two lived in a working-class neighborhood. In her bedroom, she was brutally stabbed to death. However, not much evidence was left to suggest the reason why. One can speculate as to who might have been responsible. It has now been over 40 years since Maria was murdered, making it one of the most unsolved homicides in Australia. One coroner's inquest in 1982 found Maria had been killed by someone she didn't know, and the case pretty quickly went cold. Not until 2013, did new evidence change the focus of the investigation. The latest information pointed to someone who wasn't subjected to the same level of scrutiny as some of the other suspects. It came about after colossal media attention, and at the urging of Maria's two sons. Just a couple of months ago, another inquest was held. This time, it focused on people who were either not considered at all or had been eliminated from consideration. In Thornbury, 38-year-old Maria James ran a bookshop. She lives with her two sons behind the shop in a small three-bedroom house. Mark is 13 and Adam is 11, who has cerebral palsy, Tourette's syndrome, and special needs. The bookshop was right across the street from St. Mary's Catholic School and a church where Mark was an altar boy. It was right next to the priest's house too. Mama loved her kids more than anything. In fact, she was one of the most caring mothers anyone could ask for. Despite splitting up with her husband John a few years earlier, they kept in touch and stayed friends. It was just before noon on June 17, 1980. Maria was on the phone with her ex-husband. It was someone who had just arrived, so she needed to open the door. The next thing John heard was what sounded like arguing. A strange noise came from Maria's end of the line as if she had been caught off guard. It was just silence after that. I don't think John was aware of what was wrong until he raced to the bookshop. He then found both the front door of the bookshop and the back door of her house was locked. But, he managed to climb into the place through a window. He called out to Maria. After he had walked through the house, which was unusually silent, he began to panic. That is when he reached Maria's bedroom. It was then that he discovered something quite gruesome. There, on the floor, lay the body of his ex-wife. Several pillows from the bed were scattered around her head and her feet. She looked as though she had been viciously assaulted. She was hit multiple times in the head. Her breasts had been bound together in front of her eyes, she had been stabbed 68 times. This is really terrible. Her upper and lower abdomen had been stabbed. Also, her back. Her throat had also been slashed. Immediately, John ran to a neighbor's house, where he dialed the police. It is deeply disturbing to find her in such a state, having been murdered brutally and viciously. When the police arrived at the scene, they saw two coffee cups on the kitchen counter. The phone was off the hook. Maria's bedroom walls, door, carpet, and clothes were covered in blood. If you think about it, it makes sense to ask how the killer did leave the crime scene in the first place. It's obvious that all of his clothes were stained with blood after he stabbed Marie 68 times. Marie's injuries and severity indicated that this attack lasted quite a long time. There were pieces of evidence in the house, like a broken table, which gave authorities the impression that Marie had run through the house. This gave the impression that she tried desperately to escape from her attacker. Whoever did it also drags her around the house. Maria's bloodstained bedding and clothing were taken for forensic analysis by the police and various other items from the scene. Fortunately, Maria's sons were not at home at the time. Still, their lives would never be the same after learning their mother was brutally murdered by an unknown perpetrator. After their mother's death, John took the boys into his care. Homicide team members decided to set up their headquarters at the crime scene within a bookshop. Inquirer was built on the side that made it easier to use. It also made it easier for locals to share information. John was excluded very early in the investigation, and there's no evidence he was involved. But, he was devastated when he learned Police suspected the killer was still in the house and hiding behind her bedroom door when he discovered her body. John fled out the back door seeking help, while the killer then slipped out of the front door. 
the killer then ran across the road and along Hutton Street before turning right. And this was based on the fact that two separate witnesses reported this sighting to the police, there's no doubt that whoever murdered Marie, harbored some type of deep rage that blew up at the moment. 68 stab wounds prove that too. Combined these factors led the police to believe that the killer was familiar with the area, and knew Maria in particular. The person she shared a cup of coffee with, must know her somehow. In the search for answers, investigators are trying to identify anyone in the surrounding area when the murder occurred. In fact, the bookshop was located on the main street in Thornbury. Therefore, anyone running from the scene would already have been covered in blood. Simply anyone whose appeal to the ground would have seen them. As we are talking about the early 19th century, back then, there was no CCTV, so police were unable to rely on it. They had no other choice but to entirely rely on witness testimony to lead them to the killers. So you had the two witnesses that we've already talked about. Other tips were also received from the public, which led to the description of a man seen running across High Street after the murder. The man was described as being around 5 feet 6 inches and wearing light-colored trousers. He is in his late 30s to early 40s and has dark hair. Using these tips, police sketched many individuals in the area. These sketches became known as High Street Man and Hutton Street Man. But the problem is, we obviously have different sketches. Because we have different descriptions. So, about two months after the murder, on August 25, 1980, the police formed a lineup to question the suspects. One of the suspects was identified as the High Street Man from the sketch. However, despite extensive investigations, police could not find any links between the man and Maria. A man named Peter Keogh was identified as a possible suspect by two women who knew him. Keogh was known for his history of violence, and he had a deep hatred for women. He also lived next door to Thornbury in the suburb of the North Coast when Maria was murdered. Despite this, he denied killing her. Ultimately, he ended up being excluded from the proceedings by DNA testing, after his DNA was compared to the one on Maria's pillowcase in 2003. Maria told one of her employees that she was expecting a visit in the morning, but nobody knew who the visitor was. Some of Maria's friends told the police that she was seeing a man named Peter. In the spring of 1980, Maria began dating a married real estate agent named Pico, whose nickname was Peter. Pico, however, had an alibi to prove it since he had been seen by two other people at his workplace. In fact, there was a fence separating the grounds of St. Mary's Church from the bookshop. It was just across the street, less than 600 feet away. In response, as part of their routine inquiries, police spoke with Father Bongiorno, the parish priest serving St. Mary's. On the day of the murder, Father Bongiorno was seen at the bookshop door at about 11 a.m. However, he claims that he had lunch with another priest at the time when this incident occurred. He was also removed from the list as a suspect by DNA testing in 2003. He was the one who broke the devastating news about Maria's murder to Mark. In 1982, a coroner found in an inquest that Maria had been murdered by an unknown person. Even though no criminal charges were brought against her, her two sons, Mark and Adam, remained without answers for many years afterward. No criminal charges were filed as a result of these proceedings, but Victoria Police Forensic Services continued to update Mark and Adam on any developments over the years. In the end, however, it was all bad news. This is particularly true when it comes to some of the forensic exhibits that were misplaced. For example, Maria's bedroom quilt and the clothing she wore on the day of the murder were missing. Although they were nowhere to be found. From what we can tell, no one is implying these items were purposefully misplaced. Back in 1994, some of the bloodstained bedding from the crime scene was destroyed. Homicide exhibits were being moved from police headquarters to storage. It might seem odd, but at the time, bloody exhibits that weren't claimed otherwise were considered a biological hazard. By the way, John, the ex-husband of Marie who found her body, never found out who had killed her. He died in 1996. So as we fast forward to April 2017, we discussed how her ex-husband Peter Keogh and Father Bongiorno had been cleared long ago. DNA had reportedly been found on a bloody pillowcase found at the crime scene. In the end, it turned out that the pillowcase was not even 
from Maria's crime scene. Well, it was the result of a homicide that occurred in 1975, which had no relation to Maria's death. Are you kidding me? It turns out, all of those men were wrongly cleared. However, this does not mean that they were all innocent. In reality, it was a source of serious embarrassment for Victoria Police. It had to be extremely tough for them over the years, which was also a devastating blow for both Mark and Adam. I think they all had such a strong desire to see their mother's case solved. I wonder how many opportunities were lost along the way due to some of these errors. It was announced that the case would be reopened in 2018. This is because there would be a new inquest. A shocking new development in the case has also been announced. The latest development has been described as unthinkable and shocking in light of further investigation. It has been revealed that people who were not considered suspects in the initial investigation are now being investigated. It is believed that all of this happened after Maria's youngest son Adam, as an adult, made an explosive revelation. Adam revealed that a few days before his mother was killed, he'd been sexually abused by both Father Bongiorno and Father Thomas O'Keefe. That's a huge bombshell. Well, we haven't mentioned Father O'Keefe yet, but he was the parish priest at St. Mary's. Father O'Keefe knew the James family, who attended church regularly. Adam said that after telling his mother about the abuse, she was planning to confront the clergy. And I think it is time now to start talking about persons of interest. With this latest information, we now have a new person of interest, Father Thomas O'Keefe. So far, we have spoken of five individuals, all of whom have been cleared. It was later found out they were cleared incorrectly. They should have been removed because the evidence was not even remotely connected to Maria's murder. As of today, five of the six persons of interest they have now all died. Despite this, I still strongly believe we must talk about them. I think we have to examine them in no particular order. We will then investigate to see if any of them could have possibly been the killer of Maria. The first person we need to look at is Peter Keogh. This violent criminal lived in the next suburb. Also seven years after her murder, Keogh killed a former girlfriend of his. Keogh was stalking this woman for quite some time. Keo was identified as the person in the police sketch. He did not only manage the original police description, but for many years, he was reported to have spoken to people who knew him. He suggested that he had killed her, even bragging about it. Following that, we have a childhood acquaintance of Maria. It was with this person that she had an argument on the day of the murder. Although Mario died from natural causes in 2014, we know he had a motive. Also, there is Lau Perkins, who came to the attention of the police as the high street man. Still, nothing connected him to Maria until later. Only two months after the murder, Perkins assaulted two women while hitchhiking. There was some tape and a knife found, along with a rifle, in Perkins' vehicle. But, he committed suicide in 2006. After that, I think we should talk about Father Bongiorno. He was a man who had a real motive for killing Marie. There would be a motive for murder insurance if she knew he sexually abused her son Adam. But let's not forget Father Bongiorno wasn't considered a suspect in the original investigation. He provided an alibi that he was having lunch with a priest, but he wasn't that old. The other priest's credibility was later discounted because of this alibi. Also, Father Bongiorno was doing some weird stuff. This was happening while the police were investigating. Early on, he attempted to physically force his way into the crime scene. At first, he claimed he had to administer the last rites for Marie. Or was he just trying to get in there for some other reason? Meaning that he would try to contaminate the crime scene if anything on Maria's body could link him to the incident. In 2014, however, a witness came forward to state he worked as an electrician at the father's residence on the murder day. The electrician saw a man on the day with the same description as Father Bongiorno's wearing a blue suit. He was dressed in black and wearing a clerical collar. There was blood covering the man's arm, hands and neck, all the way up to his ear on one side of him. But even though he did not appear to be injured, the electrician said he had asked him what had happened. 
In fact, he recollected the man had either told him he had cut himself. In any case in 2002, Father Bongiorno passed away from natural causes. Then there is Pico Maieschi, which I believe is the last one. Marie was involved with the man at the time of her murder, and they had been dating. Initially, Pico denied the relationship, and I have no doubt that his marriage had a great deal to do with his denial. In light of that, the police said they had initially eliminated him as a suspect due to a friend who supported his alibi. In early 2021, police spoke with Pico again, and he was the only person of interest who was still alive. As for him, I'm not sure if he had anything to do with it. Maybe he had a motive since he was in a relationship with Maria. He was also married. Perhaps there were some discussions about his wife learning about the affair. I mean, you can walk down a couple of different paths around any type of love triangle. To be fair, there are several other possibilities. There was another breakthrough announced in mid-2020 that could possibly contribute to solving this case. On the night of the murder, we discussed how Maria's bloodstained bedding was thought to have disappeared. It had been lost. Instead, it was discovered during the routine forensic homicide exhibit audit. Police found the quilts and pillows from Maria's bed during the audit. Upon closer inspection, it was found that the items had been mislabeled. In the 1980s, back when the exhibits did not have a barcode system for tracking them, it was almost impossible to determine if an exhibition had been mislabeled. So it was nearly impossible to track them down. As Mark Adam, and the investigators had been hoping the discovery of the quilt turned out to be what they had been waiting for. However, when the quilt was tested in the months following its discovery, no DNA was left to identify the murderer. During the second inquest of Maria's death, which began in early September 2021, the coroner was told that Maria had likely been stabbed with something very similar to a kitchen knife. I am not sure if the knife block Maria's kitchen contained was seized for forensic testing. This is because there was some question regarding the missing knife from a knife block there. During the inquest, it was stated that a couple of forensic avenues still need to be explored. A pillow that was found on the scene is one of these avenues. Another exhibit that can be tested for DNA is the hairs that were found on Maria's quill. However, it remains to be seen whether or not those hairs will match the DNA of Father Bongiorno. It is thought that the police may have a DNA sample from his sister that could be used in mitochondrial DNA testing. As an open critic of the police, Mark slammed the mistake they made while locating Maria's clothes, which they had lost, as well as the pillowcases that had been taken from the crime scene, and then later lost. And then there was the matter of the unrelated exhibits from another case being mistakenly tested for DNA. Although I still find this somewhat shocking. Both of them are actually losing actual evidence. And they think that evidence was taken from the crime scene when it clearly was not. It is somewhat frustrating to me. You wouldn't be able to say that things were handled correctly, I think. It is not only the electricians who were hurt at the inquest but also another person who saw Father Bongiorno covered in blood the day Maria was murdered. Mark made this extremely clear. He is adamant that Adam was actually abused in some way. His disclosure is linked to what he says happened to his mother. If you think about it, it makes sense when you realize that she has never had any issues all this time in this community. She goes to work and opens the shop day in and day out. Then Adam tells his mom what the two church fathers did. Then, she is murdered by one of the church fathers. This is either an unbelievable coincidence or a deliberate act. If it is an intentional act, then it is the motive for the murder. That makes me think that it's going to lead back to Father Bongiorno or Father O'Keefe. Assuming that this nun worked at St. Mary's, police are now looking for answers, and if they get the right answers, it could obviously lead them to the suspect that they've been looking for for over 40 years. It's been a very long time. It has been over 40 years, and they're never going to figure it out because almost all potential suspects of interest are dead. But now some of that is dependent on whether family members are cooperative. They want to give DNA samples to the police. Maybe but that's it for our episode on Maria James. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great night.